In fact, we know that the only one that survived the flood was the seed of Shem all the way down to Noah. So what did it matter who's Cain who Cain's descendants were? Well, it's there for a reason. Everything in the Bible is there for a reason, amen? That record was there for a reason. So in preparing this sermon, I looked at quite a few different commentaries because this is a touchy passage of verse. And there's basically two interpretations of this passage of verse. There's more than that, but there's two main interpretations. And, and so how do, we, how do we look at those and how do we examine them and find out which is correct? You know, if you've taken Bible Institute, we use, um, we use, I have a poster in the, in the classroom that I point out to the students all the time that tell us to observe the text. And underneath observe the text, there's a list of things that we have to discern. The who, what, when, where, how, why. Um, it's called the hermeneutical approach. And this is one of those passages of verse we have to do that. So let's unpack this passage of verse and put it back together and see if we can fully understand what it's talking about. Verse 1 may read, When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them. Now that's a pretty straightforward passage of verse. We don't really need to do a deep exegesis to understand what that's saying. It's saying that men followed the command of God. If we go back to Genesis 1, we see Adam and Eve were commanded to do what? To be fruitful and multiply. We have two chapters, Genesis chapter 4 and Genesis chapter 5, that affirm that they did just that. Because we have these lineages. We have, we have well, Adam, then Seth, then Enosh, and it goes all the way down to Lamech and then to Noah. Not only that, we live in an earth right now that the population is around 7 billion people. Well, considering God only created one man and one woman, and the fact that there's 7 billion of us running around this rock right now, that's one commandment man followed, amen? We've been fruitful and we have multiplied. Pretty straightforward. We don't need to tear that anymore apart. So, let's move on to verse 2. This is where things begin to get cloudy in our understanding of what the text is telling us. The sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. So, from this passage of verse, we basically get two different understandings. And before I explain the different understandings on this passage of verse, let's, let's connect it with another passage of verse. Jump down to verse 4. Because verse 4 is important when understanding what verse 2 is talking about. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Okay, so in verse 2 we see the term, the sons of God. Now according to our understanding of what it means today to be a child of God, what does it mean to be a child of God in 2017? A believer. A believer, right? The Bible tells us that we become children of the Most High God the moment we ask Jesus to be our personal Lord and Savior. In fact, the Bible also shows that those without a personal relationship with Jesus are called the children of the devil. You know, if we go to John chapter 8, we see in verse 44, Jesus telling the Pharisees, you belong to your father, the devil. You know, we only become a child of God the moment. We're, we're all God's creation, but we become a child of God when we ask Jesus into our heart. When we get saved. Now, this is 4,000 years before Christ, or 3,500 3, or 2,500, depending on which timeline you follow. Christ hadn't even been born. But people got saved in the Old Testament the way they get saved in the New Testament. They got saved by looking forward to the coming Messiah, where we get saved by looking back at the, at the Messiah that already came. Amen? They didn't get saved by sacrificing. That was just a picture of salvation. They didn't get saved by being a good person because our righteousness is like filthy rags to God. So, sons of God in this terminology doesn't sound like somebody that's not a believer. You know, looking at it in that context, we can say, well, that means that these people were righteous. The sons of God must have been righteous. Therefore, the daughters of men must have been unrighteous. But then we have to throw another passage of verse in it. We have to throw another passage of verse. But before we get to that, let me, let me 
Let me explain something. If verse 2 was by itself, then we could just stop right there and call it good. Say, all right, righteous, unrighteous. That's easy. We get down to verse 4 and we see this word called the filial. All right. How many of you are reading a King James Version today? Is there anybody here with the KJV? What does your text say in verse 4? Giants. Giants. You see the word giants. You don't see the word mephilium. All right? The word giants is there. Now, when we hear the term giants, what comes to mind? Oh, Goliath. Big person, right? Somebody of giant stature. But we'll get to that in just a moment. We've got to build some more information here. Another thing we need to understand is, is there a terminology in the Bible that talks about the sons of God in other places? Because we have to look at the collective whole of Scripture. We can't just take one section of verse and say, well, this is what it means, and walk away. We have to look at the collective whole. Does what we read agree with the collective whole of Scripture or contradict if it contradicts, what, what does it mean? It's a bad interpretation. Anything we read in the Bible, if we interpret it to read in a way that contradicts some other portion of the word, then we've, we've done a bad hermeneutic. So we've got to go back, all right? Does it agree? If, there's a book called um, Grasping God's Word by Scott Duvall, and it, and it lays out five things of, of hermeneutical approach, of mapping the thing, and, it, and it's taking a look at the biblical audience compared to the modern-day audience, crossing the principalization bridge, well, a fourth step of that hermeneutical process is, does it match the biblical map? Does it agree as a whole? So we have to look at everything. We know the Bible uses the term sons of God on numerous places. Some places it refers to sons of God as being Christ himself, in the son of God. Now, that's, that's an English translation of the God in the flesh, essentially. Uh, but there's another place where we read sons of God that's not referring to a human being. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Job. The book of Job, it's spelled Job. J-O-B. The book of Job. In Job chapter 1, beginning in verse 6, we read, Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and from all on the earth, and from walking up and down. All right, in this passage, we interpret the sons of God to be angels. You know, what was Lucifer? What was Satan? He was a fallen angel. You know, and it says that there was a day that God took audience with his created angels. The sons of God is what we're called in the King James Version. In the ESV, they're called that. But is that, is that automatically, can we say, all right, well, the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6 and the sons of God in Job chapter 1, are they the same? Well, they could be. But what about, do all translations agree? Let's read that passage of verse from the NIV. In the NIV, the passage says, One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. All right, reading it that way, we can say, All right, the sons of God is just the King James or some other translation. The NIV says the angels. End of story, done. Well, that's not really a good hermeneutic. If you don't like the way one translation reads, you don't find a translation that reads how you want it to read. So we still have an answer to the question, who are the sons of God? We can't say, well, the KJV and the ESV and the NASB, all them translators messed it up, and the NIV translators were right because they had this and that and the other. That's, that's, that's a wishy-washy way of interpreting the word. You know, what do we do? Say, well, I don't like how that reads, so I'm going to get the message out and going to go with a paraphrase. We have to look deeper at the collective whole of Scripture. Now, based off of that reading of the book of Job, that means that the sons of God found in Genesis chapter 6 are angels, or fallen angels, demons, if, if you will, right? And some people say demons come down and had relations with the daughters of men, meaning with humans, and they conceived, and the result were these giants that were born, and they were half angel, half 
all human. Based off of what we looked at so far, you could arise at that terminology. But does it fit with the biblical whole? Does it fit with the biblical map as a whole? Is there anywhere in Scripture that that's contradictory? Yes, there is. First of all, we're not in great mythology. We don't have demigods. We don't have uh, supernatural beings reproducing with human beings. All right? God is a God of order. He's not a God of confusion. He's not a God of, um, um, uh, uh, of craziness. And essentially that would be craziness, all right? Uh, what is the purpose of the human condition, male and female? It's procreation. Plain and simple, procreation. Marriage was defined between one man and one woman for the act of multiplying and replenishing in the earth. Now, especially in the area we believe in, some people believe that marriage continues after you die. But that does not match the biblical whole of Scripture. So, once again, we're going to have to look at another passage of verse. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. In Matthew 22, beginning in verse 23, we read, The same day the Sadducees came to him, who say there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. So too, the second and the third, down to the seventh. After them all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. But Jesus answered them, You are wrong, because you know that neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. Alright, in this passage we read nothing about sons of God. We read nothing about daughters of men. We don't see the term giant or nephilim. Um, what, what we do read is this was not a good woman to marry, amen? This was a black <laughs> widow, all right? But what we read here in this passage has nothing to do with the context of what we are reading. Or does it? Or does it? You know, the parable itself is dealing with the resurrection. You know, this takes place during the Passion Week. There was several different sects of Judaism during, during Christ's ministry. One sect of Judaism was called the Sadducees. And one of the things the Sadducees were renowned for is they did not believe there was a resurrection. They did not believe that there was any form of bodily resurrection. And so the whole purpose of this analogy that they shared with Jesus was trying to trick him. You know? And so what they did is they said, well, you know, a man dies and he leaves his widow without child. Well, under the law of Moses, under the law passed down on Sinai, it was the responsibility of the next brother to give her seed so the inheritance could be passed. It wasn't just to make a bunch of kids, it was so that the inheritance could be rightfully passed. Well, and they come up with the analogy that, well, one brother dies, and then the next brother dies, and the next brother dies, and finally all seven brothers, and then the woman dies. And they were put in the context of, well, in the resurrection, whose wife is she? Well, Jesus didn't address that question, what did Jesus say? Look at verse 30. And, and what we read in verse 30 helps us in what we're looking at today. In verse 30 we read, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. Now if we look at that in context, that in the future, in the future, Following the resurrection, the human condition is going to be like the angels, meaning they do not reproduce. They have no need to reproduce. The angels right now do not reproduce, and they have no need to. Angels are created beings. All the angels, whether they're the righteous angels that are, are, are messengers and servants of the Most High God, or the fallen angels who we call demons today, they are all created by God. The human condition is different. God created two, man and Eve, man and woman, Adam and Eve. Every human, including us here today, 
are a result of the way God established the humans come into existence. Procreation. Amen? That was the purpose of marriage. That was the purpose of what we have today. What Jesus is saying here is angels don't reproduce. They have no need to reproduce. And nowhere in Scripture do we find angels reproducing. Nowhere. So that throws out the angels come down and had relations with daughters of men and created these half-breed giants running around that um, God had to destroy. Not only that, in the book of Numbers, in the book of Numbers, which is a number of years after the flood, in fact, Numbers takes place during the 40 years the Israelites were wandering in the desert, we find that word once again, Nephilim. We find it when um, the spies are sent to spy out the promised land, and they come back to give a report to Moses. And ten of the spies says, we can't go there. There's Nephilim, or there's giants. Well, we know that the flood wiped out all but eight people. So did God allow that to happen again? No, that, so that, that, that's not working. That's contradicting Scripture. We cannot say the sons of God were angelic beings, whether good or bad, in habit, that, that had relations with men, because that does not fit with the collective whole of Scripture. So basically what we've done is created more questions and confusion than we had to start out with. Amen? <laughs> now there's another view, and it's a less held view. There's another view that some people believe that, um, that these sons of God were humans that, that reproduced with other humans, but they were possessed. That the, 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 the demons possessed them. All right? Now that could happen. You know, we know that people get demon-possessed. We saw Jesus cast out a legion of demons at the gathering demon act. We see Peter and Paul cast out demons. We know that throughout the, the biblical whole, I believe people are demon-possessed today. Oh, yes. I believe there's a lot of people that are demon-possessed today, but we don't want to use that term, so we come up with medical terms. Mm -hmm. And we treat them with drugs. Yep. You know, the, the, some, of the, some of the diagnoses we have in the, in the psychology world today mirror the biblical descriptions of what happened when they cast demons out. There was demons at the time of Jesus. There were demons in the Old Testament. There's demons inhabiting people now. Not believers, mind you, because God's jealous God. He will not share a vessel. But if a demon-possessed person, obviously not saved or not a believer, because a, a demon's not going to inhabit the same house as the Holy Spirit, why would they be called the sons of God? Probably not a good terminology. So I'm going to throw that, translate, that, that one out as well. So now what do we have to look at? What do we have to look at now? I mentioned earlier the King James Version translates the term Nephilim to giants. Because giants is one of the, um, if you look up in a concordance, it's one of the definitions. But once again, as I mentioned, as I mentioned giants earlier, um, I asked what you thought of when you hear the term giant. If you're talking about the Bible and you hear the word giant, you're probably going to picture a young shepherd boy flipping a rock at a giant, right? You know, we know the, we know the description of Goliath. Goliath is nine feet tall. Now, that was a big boy, right? Or, if we're not looking in the biblical context, we might look at it as a giant as something from a fairy tale. You think Jack and the Beanstalk and the words fee fi fo fum come to mind, amen? You know, but anytime you think of the word giant, you think of something of a large stature. But that's not what Nephilim translates as. Nephilim, if you look in a concordance, um, translates, um, or in Hebrew, implies not so much the idea of great stature as of reckless ferocity, um, daring characters who spread devastation and carnage far and wide. A better translation in the English would be bully or tyrant. Uh, people, men that were wicked, they were ungodly, they were disobedient to authority, they were, they were anti-God, if you will. You know, uh, is there an affiliate among us today? The whole of society against God, wicked, tyrant, bullies. You know, we see that this is a word that has been sensationalized. 
It's been sensationalized. There's, there's pastors today preaching that these were an unholy relation between, um, between angels and, and men. But I disagree with that. And, I, and I'm going to show you why. I'm going to show you why I view this the way I view it. Because Scripture confirms Scripture. Amen? Yes. Now remember several weeks ago, we were looking at genealogies. And, and I pointed out when we were looking at Genesis chapter 5. And we get from Adam to Noah. And then we looked at Luke chapter 3. And we can go, in Luke chapter 3, we can go from Jesus back to Adam. Amen? That's an important genealogy. It's a very important genealogy because it fulfilled prophecy. We know that Jesus had to be from the seed of the woman, right? All the way back to Eve. And that genealogical record shows that. If we, if we look, we can find this in Chronicles. We can find it in Numbers. Uh, we get to all that so-and-so begat, so-and-so, and we're like, man, this is boring. But there's a purpose for it. There's a purpose for it. It traces Christ back to Eve. And that's important because Genesis 3.15, God said that the seed of the woman would strike the head of the serpent. You know, and so we have to have that. But with that in mind, why do we need the lineage of Cain? You ever thought about that? Why is it there? We know Cain's seed did not make it through the flood. So why is it there? It's there to show us what the, what the daughters of men were. It was there to show that that ungodly line of Cain reproduced. And we can go back to Genesis 4 in the, closing, in the closing verses, and we see Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch, not Enoch that was translated, another Enoch. And, the, and, and to Enoch was born Ered, and Ered fathered Mahujael, and Mahujael fathered Methuselah, Methuselah, or excuse me, Methusiel. And we can read all this down, and we can see that this lineage runs congruent or with the lineage of Seth all the way down to the flood, and then it stops. But what's important to note is look at look at verse four. Let's go back and look at verse four, where it says in chapter six, verse four, it says, uh, "These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown." You know, I interpret that as that godly line of Seth, mighty men, the men of old. I mean, these boys all lived nine hundred plus years. They were old. They were old and renowned, right? And they have this godly line. I believe that the sons of God were the godly line of Seth. They were the, and the daughters of men were the ungodly line of Cain. And you might be saying, well, what's the problem there? They were both human. Yeah, they were. But does the scripture, does this agree with scripture? Does the scripture tell us not to become unequally yoked in today's world? You know, we raise our children, we raise our teenagers up to find a spouse that matches their belief system for a reason. In fact, the Bible tells us this. If we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, we read, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? From this verse, we see a warning about becoming unequally yoked. Now, there is the rare circumstance where a believer and an unbeliever marry, and the unbeliever becomes a believer. But statistically, it is very rare. It's usually the other way. And in fact, I can give you a lot more examples of it going the other direction than I can of, the, of it going the good direction. What happens is a believer, when they become unequally yoked, when they, when they marry an unbeliever, what does the believer do with the unbeliever? Does the believer lead the unbeliever to the Lord? Once in a while. But statistically, the unbeliever pulls the believer out of fellowship. Pulls the unbeliever out of fellowship, out of, out of spending time with God. Essentially, they hinder the believer's relationship. Not only that, the children born to them are oftentimes unchurched. Because what you have is you have a, well, we're going to let them choose for themselves. Um, we don't want to force our beliefs on them. I don't believe. I believe our kids can make the choice. Our children don't have that choice. When they're 18, they have that choice. When they move out on their own, amen, when they fly away, uh, they have that choice. But when they're under your household, you have a responsibility. In Deuteronomy chapter uh, 6, we find the Shema that says, raise up, or it tells us, talk about the things of God when you sit down. When you rise up, bind them on your forehead, place them on your arm. 
but in, a, in, a, in an unequally yoked household, that is not happening. That is not happening. You know, I, I had a conversation with somebody a couple months ago, and this person stated, well, people will get a chance to, 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 to hear about Jesus after they die. No. The Bible says every tongue will confess and every new. Yeah, they will. They will, but it'll be too late. And this person's response was, well, what about my children? They don't know about God. I said, why didn't you tell them? Well, because me and my husband are we used to disagree. I said, well, huh, you're still alive. They're still alive. Better be to tell them. You know, that's, that's the problem with being unequally yoked. And I think that's what happened in Genesis. You had the godly line of Seth. These, they, and we know from Cain's genealogy, we know they boasted in their wickedness. Amen? We know in, in, in chapter 4, verse um, 23, Lamech said to his wives, plural, Lamech was the first recorded polygamist. Um, he was in defiance to God. Um, he took two wives. He said, Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. This man boasted in his wickedness, right? The Nephilim, or the giants, as you will, or this lineage that brought um, a, a the disobedient world were the result of the righteous children of the godly line of Seth forsaking God, chasing beauty. You know, what was the reason? What does the text tell us? They found them attractive. They found them attractive. Look at, look at throughout the Old Testament, every time the godly line of Israel chased after foreign um, wives. Who was the wisest man on earth? Solomon. King Solomon. But if you read about King Solomon, even with all his wisdom, when he went after wives of foreign descent that worshipped other gods, he soon began to worship those other gods. Even the wisest man on earth. So, putting the collective whole of Scripture together, what do we see? We see that this destruction, this, this uh, wickedness was a result of ungodly yoking, of unequally yoking. And it's happening today. It's happening today. One other thing I'd like you to notice in this passage of verse is found in verse 3. We jump from 2 to 4. We need to look at verse 3 because verse 3 is important in the context of the flood. In verse 3 it says, Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. Now, there's several different analogies of what his spirit is. You know, when we get saved, the Holy Spirit abides in us, right? The Holy Spirit makes his dwelling in us. But the very life of man is sustained by the Spirit of God. Amen? You know, the first man, what does it say? God created Adam from the dust of the earth, and he breathed life into him. He placed his spirit into him. What, what he's doing is he's pronouncing judgment. God is pronouncing judgment. He says, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. God makes a vow to destroy all humanity in 120 years. Some people interpret this saying, post-flood, post-flood, the age of man is going to go from living 900 years down to 120 well, that's not true. We know Abraham lived more than 120 years. We know Noah lived more than 120 years. Um, and we know at this time, Noah has not even been mentioned. In his context in the flood hasn't been mentioned yet. We know that Noah, um, we know that Noah was, was 600 years old when the flood started. You know? But we know that the flood began 120 years after this pronouncement was made. And God... God was going to destroy all men. What we're going to read about that next week. You know, let's, let's read on just a couple of verses. In closing, I want to read these last couple of verses to set the stage for next week. Beginning at verse 5, it says, The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. Wow, that's a strong word. God was grieved that he ever created man. And basically what God says is I'm giving man 120 years and I'm destroying it all. 
I'm, and and, and we, we, we read on later and we see that God doesn't destroy it all. He destroys most of it. And we'll look at that next week. But what I'd like you to notice here is that God immediately say, man is wicked, boom, he's done. No, he gave him 120 years. Do you know that this happened with the times of Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah? Four generations of preachers preached, turn to God, turn away from your sin, or judgment will befall you. You know, if we read about the flood, Noah didn't build a boat overnight. In fact, Noah, Noah's first son wasn't born until 20 years after he started building the boat. It took Noah 120 years. He was bivocational. He was a boat builder by day and a preacher by night. And he preached to the people, turn away from your sin, turn to God, or he's going to bring judgment. Not only that, we're going to read later that when God shuts the ark, Noah and his family go on the ark, God shuts the door. It didn't start to rain for seven days. He gave them seven days even after he shut the door of the ark. And there's, there's some, there's some um, symbolic pictures of that. You know, God's going to bring judgment on this earth for seven years. The book of Revelation tells us. And we'll get into all that later. But we can look throughout the Bible and we can see how patient God is. Even in their wickedness. And one thing I look at this, I look at this and I, and I, and I read this verse that God was grieved. And I look at our world today. And I look at how wicked our world is today. And I can only imagine what these people look like. That God, God lets us all keep on going, you know. But in the New Testament, we read that when God's return happens, when Jesus comes back and takes his bride and he raptures his church, it will be like the days of Noah. You know, I think we're getting there. I think we're getting there. We look at, we look at this world today, I think we're getting back to like in the days of Noah. You know, man is no respecter of person. The most dangerous place for an unborn baby today is the mother's womb. You know, we, we are, we are, uh, I can only imagine what the people of this day looked like that God was repenting that he ever made them and vowed to destroy them all. But even in his wrath, even in his anger, he shows his love and his patience. He gives them 120 years. How long have you been testing God's patience? Has God been patient with you? If you're sitting here today and do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, I encourage you to change that. I encourage you to change that. I'm going to ask uh, everyone to please stand, and I'm going to ask our praise team to come forward. If you're sitting here today without a personal relationship with Jesus, we'd like to help you rectify that. It begins with a prayer of surrender. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says, Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Are you sitting here today? and need to confess Jesus as your Lord? If so, I invite you to repeat this prayer after me. 